Hello, I'm your host, Kyrie Douglas, and welcome to Catalyzing Computing, the official podcast of the Computing Community Consortium. The Computing Community Consortium, or CCC for short, is a programmatic committee of the Computing Research Association. The mission of the CCC is to catalyze the computing research community and enable the pursuit of innovative, high-impact research. In this episode of Catalyzing Computing, I sit down with 2018 ACM Prize in Computing winner Shwedek Patel at the Heidelberg Laureate Forum in Heidelberg, Germany. Dr. Patel is a professor in computer science and engineering and electrical engineering at the University of Washington, where he directs his research group, the UbiComp Lab. He is also a CCC council member. His research interests are in the areas of human-computer interaction, ubiquitous computing, sensor-enabled embedded systems, and user interface software and technology. His work includes developing new sensing systems for mobile health, including BillyCam, an application for detecting infant jaundice, and HemaApp for measuring hemoglobin levels in the blood to detect anemia and other conditions. Both applications use a standard cell phone camera to capture the necessary information. The Heidelberg Laureate Forum, or HLF, is a networking conference where 200 carefully selected young researchers in mathematics and computer science spend a week interacting with the laureates of the disciplines, recipients of the Abel Prize, ACM AM Turing Award, ACM Prize in Computing, Fields Medal, and Nevelina Prize. Established in 2013, the HLF is annually organized by the Heidelberg Laureate Forum Foundation. So you're listening to Catalyzer Computing here with Swedek Patel here in Heidelberg, Germany. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So could you give a brief overview about your background? Where did you grow up and how did you decide to study computer science? Yeah, um, I've, uh, I grew up in um, Birmingham, Alabama, which is uh, something that a lot of people, when I tell them, are quite surprised about, uh, uh, hence my southern accent, I guess, or the lack <laughs> of. Um, yeah, I grew up in Alabama. My parents immigrated to the U.S. before I was born, so I was born in the U.S. And uh, yeah, when they immigrated to the U.S., they um, both were engineers, but in the, in the 70s, they couldn't really practice their trade. And so they did what a lot of uh, Patels at the time did. They went into the motel business. So I actually grew up in a motel, uh, which was like an apartment that was connected to the back of the lobby of the motel. Um, and so I was always a tinkerer. So I grew up as a tinkerer. I always built stuff. I was a hands-on. Uh, I was lucky and got access to a computer early on. And so I knew I was going to do something around technology, but I was a lot more hands-on than people. When people assumed I was going to be a mechanical engineer, I was going to go in purely electrical engineering. But I think uh, computing is what kind of drew me in. But that's how my research has evolved, actually, is that even though I'm a computer scientist, I do a lot of work with sensing and hardware and looking at the intersection of sensors and machine learning uh, with hardware. And so, uh, so I think because of my, when I grew up being a hands-on person and liking to build stuff with my hands, I think that's influenced a lot of my research. Um, but also when I grew up in the motel, I did a lot of things like vacuuming the, vacuuming the rooms and doing the beds and think I uh, have 10,000 beds under my belt at this point um, <laughs> growing up. Um, and I don't think many people can say that they've made 10,000 beds in their lifetime. Um, but, uh, but I also like, worked in the motel, so I did the electrical work, did the plumbing work, and little did I know that that would serve me well in the future in terms of some of the sustainability work I do as a researcher. Okay. Um, but yeah so, that's, yeah, so I got into computing early. And with, you know, really emphasis on hands-on work. So that kind of tinkering really played a, a core role. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, in yeah. Yeah, little did my parents know that that tinkering would serve me well. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of broken devices and technology and gadgets and gizmos, uh, but... I think in the end, they realized that that was well worth it. Yeah. Um, so you got your PhD at Georgia Tech, right? That's right. Uh, and during your press conference yesterday, you mentioned that you spent some time with the ATDC there, which is, I guess, like an incubator for yeah. entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, could you talk about any influence that had on your career? Yeah, it was interesting. So the ATDC was a program that basically helped um, translate technology into commercial impact. Um, and at the time, when I was a grad student, the whole notion of commercialization was actually new. I remember joining the faculty at the University of Washington after I graduated. The one of the pieces of feedback I got early on uh, was that, hey, he's too entrepreneurial. I'm like, what does that even mean, too entrepreneurial? <laughs> um, and, and fast forward 10 years, that's a weird comment to even think about, right? right. Um, but, uh, but ATDC was kind of, it gave me this realization that, hey, you can be a researcher and academic, do the basic science research and do the, do the kind of the exploration, groundbreaking work, and actually at the same time have an impact. So it actually got me thinking that, hey, you, there could be this world I could live in where I could do the fun research, but help translate that work out into the real world as well. And so, um, yeah, so we had a paper that I did. It was actually a paper that I did with my, one of my colleagues, a couple of my colleagues around um, building a technology that could prevent somebody from taking a picture of an object. So it was a camera blocking technology. Um, this was a UbiComp, what was it, 2015 paper? Mm -hmm. um, 
2015, oh, 2005 paper. Um, and it was, it was a simple concept where you could actually detect a camera because you could identify the lens because of its retroreflective property, and then you would shine light back at it. So if you ever try to take a picture of a, an exhibit that you don't want photographed, you can never take a perfect picture because it's all washed out. Wow. And so um, it got a lot of publicity and press, and then we're like, oh, let's try to commercialize this. And that was my first attempt. So was that like a, like a material or like a light that would block the other yeah, it, camera? Yeah, which is basically, um, you know, if you have a projector, you just shine light back at it. So when you shine light at a camera, you know how it washes it out because the white balance causes it. So if you flash light at it, it'll goof up the white balance on the camera. And so you can never take a perfect picture of it. And you could tell that the camera is in the field of view because of the CCD sensor is retroreflective. Mm. So you can use computer vision to figure out where the camera is and just shine a little bit of light at it and you can never take a perfect picture. Clever. Um, and if you try to hide it, then you're hiding the lens. But, but anyway, this was kind of the first time where it's like, oh, I could actually take this concept. We can try to commercialize it. So my advisor and I tried to, you know, try, tried it out and tried to take ATCC funding to, to commercialize it. And that, from that point on, that kind of gave me this inspiration that, hey, you know, there is this opportunity to commercialize technology. Yeah. So have you been involved in any similar kind of uh, institutions, like incubator type yeah. things in terms of helping support other people? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, at the University of Washington, we have our, our tech transfer office has a number of different incubators, everything from actually physically incubating companies. So we have companies that are on campus where they pay subsidized rent, and, but they have all the facilities there to really make it easy for researchers to transfer their technology out in the real world. Um, so I, I've mentored faculty and students in this space. And so, yeah, and helped some, build some of these programs. At UW, I've actually helped build a technology innovation degree, which is a, actually a master's degree that at the same time of incubating a concept and teaching students to be entrepreneurial, you can actually get a master's degree along the way. So we've tried a number of different concepts. So yeah, so there's been everything from that to just traditional incubation. Okay. So yesterday in your press conference related to sort of the innovation idea, you talked about a concept called naive innovation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, could you explain what that means and maybe give an example of when you've used that? In yeah. Um, this concept of naive innovation is something that I just literally made up a few years ago, which is trying to explain this concept that, um, so I do a lot of applied research. Um, so sustainability, healthcare, all kinds of areas where, you know, you want to have domain experts working with you to actually solve an important problem. But sometimes one of the things I've noticed or I've realized and some things that a lot of researchers as probably have noticed is that when you have an expert in an area and you tell them what should be built, if you do the formative work that you would do in HCI to find the solutions or at least find opportunities for solutions, you, you get a sense of what the design space might be or where opportunities improvement are. But sometimes a lot of those experts are, are applying the same lens that they've always applied, right? They have the, their experience, the dogma, that's where they come from. And so their solutions might be solving a problem, but they might not be radical enough to really change the landscape, change the game, or really push the field forward. So sometimes having somebody that just knows enough about the field comes in it from a kind of a, from an outside perspective will always have this naive approach to it. But sometimes those naive approaches may actually be the more radical ways of thinking about the problem that could actually uncover some new solutions that nobody would have really thought about if you just had the domain experts thinking about it. So that's where a lot of the work we've done in health, where we've kind of tackled it from a kind of a wacky standpoint, actually has opened up these new areas, um, or at least have our medical researchers or collaborators to think about it in a different way where they never would have thought it was possible. So that's what I mean by naive innovation is that somebody that comes in that might not be an expert, that's not a bad thing. You might actually have a different perspective on it. Right. Could you give an example where either you've applied that to a field, a domain that you didn't know about, or maybe you brought yeah. someone in and they... Yeah, I mean, this happens a uh, so a concrete example of some of the work we've done in health uh, around uh, cough sensing and detection. So uh, for, for many years, we've been working on algorithms that can help from just the audio source um, identify when people are coughing. From a clinical standpoint, if you ask a physician, you know, oh, I'm going to detect when somebody's coughing, their, their response would be like, why would you ever do that? Because people always cough. That's like the number one symptom for most pulmonary <laughs> diseases. But, but my my point of view on that was, well, most people don't know when they're coughing. If you tell some, ask somebody, how often did you cough? Today, they're going to grossly under or overestimate it. And secondly, um, there is literature that's demonstrated if you can track when people are coughing in the evening, it can be an indicator, a pre-indicator for disease pre-symptomatically. Um, but even more than that, my hypothesis was, you know, there might be something in that cough. When somebody coughs, it has to mean something. Could it mean that that cough is be generated because they have pneumonia? Or is it just because they have a common cold? Or is it a tuberculosis cough? When you talk to a, an expert or pulmonologist about it, their first response is, no way, I can't hear that uh, one cough is a TB cough versus another. But they don't have the same kind of perspective on how to decompose a audio signal. Whereas when you look at from the computer science standpoint, from a Fourier transform standpoint, and you look at the signal, there's actually things in there that you can't hear that are 
audibly, acoustically, that a human can't really pick apart that is indicative of a TB cough, but you can actually see in the signal. So that's a good example of that. It's like their first response was coughs are useless, but, but later on when we proved it out, is oh, there is entropy in that <laughs> signal. And so that completely changed the whole way of looking at um, uh, audio biomarkers. So that kind of work is why I guess you won the ACM Prize of Computing, this ubiquitous um, computing technology. Can you talk a little bit about, one, what winning the prize meant to you, and two, um, any other projects that sort of contributed to, the, to winning that? Yeah, I mean, I was uh, really humbled to uh, be a recipient of the ACM Prize in Computing, and, and it recognized two areas of research that I've been working on for the last decade or over a decade, is um, the application of computing to sustainability. So some of the earlier work that we did in energy and water monitoring, so using combination machine learning and simple sensors to disaggregate energy usage in the home and water usage. And the students have, you know, really um, get the credit for a lot of that work. The early work there was a number of great students. And even some of the more recent work that was also honored was more around taking that concept of using commodity devices for solving important problems around, in that case, it's looking at mobile phones. So how do you leverage sensors on a phone for screening a diagnosis of disease? And so those were the two things that were um, cited in the ACM Prize. But at the end of the day, I always give the honor to the students because they're the ones that actually do the hard work and the real work. Um, I don't know why I get these awards. I, I think the students should also be recognized. But it's, it's actually great to see that uh, applied research is also being recognized too. So that's another thing that um, is really exciting about it. So how many students do you typically have, like, on average? Yeah, um, it depends on how you count. Um, I would say on a, 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 I usually have a dozen or so PhD students, mm -hmm. um, maybe 10 at some point, and then 16, it's just kind of, on average, 10 to 12. Um, I usually run a big lab because I'm all over the place sometimes. You know, I do a lot of hardware, software, everything in between there, where it's like, interaction hardware and software. Um, when you do applied research, you have to have people with different kinds of expertise. So the lab has a lot of backgrounds, electroengineering, computer science, some people have a little bit more of a bioengineering experience. And so having those perspectives are important in the lab. And so having a big lab actually makes a big difference for the kind of work we do. And then any given moment, it could be, you know, maybe a few undergrads to a dozen undergrads. So, um, so the lab's fairly vibrant, full of undergrads and grad students. So at this point, I mean, you're pretty notable in the field, so I'm sure you get a lot of students who want to work with you. But uh, I guess earlier, how did you go about assembling sort of that team? Yeah, that's a good question for, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, the when you're starting as an assistant professor, you know, one of the most critical things is to recruit, you know, your first couple students to really help you push your research agenda forward. So I was actually fairly lucky. Uh, so at, at the University of Washington, we have a very supportive, amazingly collaborative um, a set of colleagues there and faculty. And so a lot of the credit actually goes to my mentors at UW who helped me recruit the initial students. So I co-advise a fairly senior student. So there was a student there, John Freilich, that was already a student at UW, but I started co-advising him because he wanted to move his more, more into sustainability. And so, um, so I ended up co-advising him with James Landay. And so that having a senior student is a really great way to seed your lab. Um, so that, that worked really well. I had a couple of colleagues uh, in the department as well who also had some first year students that were looking for an advisor and that their research actually overlapped with my work a little bit more than theirs. And they had indicated to them that you might want to talk to Schwedek and see if that's a good research fit and it was. And so very early on, I was able to get great students. And then second year onward, I was able to kind of look for the students in the applicant pool to be able to pull for talented students. But for, from day one, I actually always look for the diamonds in the rough. Um, it was always students that, not necessarily that came from the usual universities, it was really looking for these intangibles around creativity, looking at how they persevered. Um, some of the other things I tried to assess is kindness, which is hard to do from my application, but when you talk to them, you can. When I uh, gave the speech for the ACM Prize in Computing, uh, one of the comments I made is, I'll take kindness over technical any day, because I can teach the technical stuff. It's the kindness that makes a big difference, because that's going to enable how you collaborate with people, how do you work with your um, users in terms of when you're interacting with them, it, and that's something that's even more important important to me these days than the technical stuff. Okay. So you mentioned sort of looking for people with soft skills like creativity and kindness. Yeah. Um, I guess what methods did you use to sort of uncover that about people uh, yeah. in interviews and stuff? Yeah, like that's a that? good question. Um, so um, a lot of times you can kind of just um, see from the kind of work that they've done, right? And and then when you ask them about the work, you can actually know how genuine they are about it. Did they do the work just because they did the work to get it into their application? Or did they do the work because they had some personal motivation or some connection to it? And when that when you see their passion come out, when they explain it, that's the number one key from that. And you could totally tell that it's their passion about it and that that's their genuine interest versus it's just they did it just for the sake of doing it to get it on a resume. Right. Right. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. 
Um, like as a manager, do you ever have to deal with personality conflicts within the lab? Um, and if so, how have you resolved those? Yeah, there, there's always personality conflicts. There's always, um, yeah, there's always things that you have to deal with at, when you have a team, right? Um, it's, uh, uh, I'm very conscientious about when I build a team. I build a team in a way that, you know, they have to be collaborative, unselfishness, like that's key. And, and I, I'm very upfront with the students about, hey, if you're going to work by yourself and not really interact with the lab, that's not the style. That kind of style of interaction works for some, but not for us. But it happens. But I, I use it as a learning opportunity. These things happen. They should happen. Because if they're not happening, then you're, you're creating an environment that's unrealistic in the real world. But we use those as learning opportunities. And often I let, I mean, I'm more of a facilitator and I let the students really try to drive how they resolve it because the mo best thing I can do is empower them. Um, but I use it, usually use it as a learning opportunity. Um, but those are, I would say those are healthy uh, conflicts that are happening because that's what the real world is. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in your interview with GeekWire about the ASIM Prize, you mentioned that you've been kind of recently looking at city-level devices and embedded technologies on that level. Yeah. Uh, do you have any current research or future sort of plans uh, in yeah. that area? Yeah, I mean, I, there's still, still so many things to solve in healthcare, so there's going to be a lot of work in health continuing in the lab, obviously. But uh, but some of the er other areas that I'm interested in trying to potentially start to do some more work in is to look at things like examining kind of thoroughly this concept of smart cities. Um, I worry that the way that we're approaching the concept of smart cities, or at least a lot of government officials or um, city planners are approaching it is, uh, let's just take high-tech technology, self-driving cars and these sensors and just jam them into a city. I, I think we should take a step back and think about the thoughtful ways of actually integrating technology into the cities. So I'm trying to think about new research areas that could actually do something like that in a, in a different or a unique way. So that's a er set, set of early ideas that we're looking at. But uh, but just trying to see, because of the urbanization and the re-urbanization of these areas, we're trying to figure out how do you build resilient cities, how to build uh, healthier, sustainable cities, and that's something that I've been thinking about. Okay. Yeah. So during your press conference yesterday, you talked a lot about the technologies that you've been building um, mm -hmm. with healthcare to advance, I guess, equitable access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a lot of those examples were outside mm -hmm. of the U.S., but how do you see healthcare... Uh, advancing that access within the U.S. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So a lot of the um, use cases that I've been pushing on have uh, have a lot of global health impact. Um, but but that doesn't preclude them from having having impact in in the U.S. or or in developed countries, um, because you know a lot of the. Uh, a lot of things that I've been pushing on is trying to bring healthcare out of the four walls of the hospital or the, or the clinic. And so how do you bring it into the home? How do you bring it on the go? How do you start to detect the onset of disease pre-symptomatically? Those kinds of things. And the global health sector, a lot of those issues that we're trying to deal with are just more at the forefront. And so so being able to study that is actually faster to study those issues. If you think about tuberculosis, I mean, the, the, the notion of infectious diseases applies to a lot of things, influenza and other kinds of diseases that, that have impact globally. But um, but I've been focused on the global health sector mainly because it's it's a way to at least demonstrate these things in areas where you can have immediate impact. But there's a ton of crossover, right? Um, by having a mobile platform that could screen or diagnose disease, you can imagine that being done at the home by a caregiver uh, doing it in rural communities. So the way I think about it is um, as we start to improve healthcare outside of the United States, we can also learn a lot about what are those methods and techniques that are working to be able to improve healthcare in the U.S. So one of the ways to think about it is like if you think about what happened to the telephone, so when the telephone network was very ubiquitous in the United States, then you had basically the uh, the mobile phone that came out. In a lot of developing countries, you kind of leapfrogged the telephone landline model and you went straight to a phone, right? You kind of leapfrogged this whole technological advancement that happened in the U.S. because it wasn't quite ready enough, but when those regions were ready for mobile or, or for telephony, you went straight to mobile. So I, I often look at the use cases in... Um, developing countries as a way to leapfrog the, the health innovation in a way that let's actually implement the thing that actually makes sense. Whereas in an entrenched or set of processes and organizations in the U.S., it's tougher to do that. It's hard to make that major change. So could we leapfrog in these other communities and then use that as a way to bring it back to see if we can actually innovate there? So that's kind of one of the ways that we've been thinking about Okay. It. Yeah. That's an interesting way to think about things. So I guess related to sort of improving health in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, you're helping to organize an upcoming CCC workshop mm -hmm. on mental health and addiction. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
coming up in November in Washington, D.C. Can you talk a little bit about that workshop and the goals of uh, of that? Yeah, Yeah, and the goals of this workshop is to uh, bring together researchers in computer science, but also uh, experts in addiction and mental health, to be able to bring these communities together to really figure out what are the challenges here. You know, the goals of our CCC workshops are to catalyze new research activities. And what we want to do is there's been great work around sensing for overdose. There's been work in, you know, detecting uh, opioid overdose interventions. Then you have the health community and the researchers look looking at new intervention techniques and support groups on how to manage those kinds of conditions. But now what we want to see is how can that field come together? And so the idea behind this is to basically showcase some of the innovative work on the computer science side, but also on the health side as well, and create a forum to be able to get those communities to work together. That sounds great. Um, So this might be kind of out of left field, but I've noticed that at any CCC workshop that involved medical technology, people seem to have a lot of complaints about the electronic uh, record keeping system within the United States. Right. Do you have any thoughts on that or could yeah. you expound on why yeah. people have problems with that? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's hard to, it's always like the, like the elephant in the room where right? it always gets discussed, right? It's like, you know, you can't have a censor conversation without having a whole debate on privacy, right? Um, so how do you handle privacy? And you got to kind of have to get past that to get to the deeper questions about censors. The same thing in healthcare. You can't quite have a health and wellness or healthcare conversation without going down an electronic health record debate, right? Um, and so a part of that is because the healthcare system right now has an electronic health record, but it was always designed around helping manage billing. It was for billing purposes. It, it basically made it easier to charge insurance, charge patients and providers for those kinds of use cases, but then it was adapted for holding the medical records data. So it was never a perfect solution. And so the challenge has always been that, oh, if you have a great innovative sensor technology or intervention, where are you going to put it? Because the health records are so hard to integrate with. And so that's one of the challenges. My thinking right now has been looking at, let's kind of do this in parallel. Let's figure out what are the needs and the use cases so we can better inform what a future health record system could look like. What can a personal health record look like? What should an electrical health record look like? So instead of creating these band-aids, I think the research community can actually drive what are the type of data, data sets, and the kinds of data you need to protect to inform the design of a, of a health record system that actually makes sense. So I think that's where the narrative should be, but it's tough to have that because we already have a fairly entrenched set of organizations around digital health records. Right. So I guess similar to what you were just discussing with telephones, yeah. like it's already entrenched. So how do you see that evolving? Like yeah. do you see it sort of slow changes or there will be a whole new system? Yeah, it's it's going to be hard. Uh, it's hard to know, actually. That's a good question. I mean, I think one way you can think about it is that I can see a change where users have their access to their own health records, right? You can capture more and more of your own data because you have a phone, you'll have wearables in the future and being able to have access to your own data that you're capturing and that world has to get married with the health world at some point because you have this incredible amount of valuable data on an individual from a health perspective and that definitely needs to be utilized for one's healthcare. And I think that can kind of drive change in terms of where the data is coming from. It's hard to just have a whole new electronic health record from scratch. Um, there's been a lot of organizations that have been trying to do that where they've created created health record systems that are supposed to be revolutionary, but it's really hard to get into that. But I think it's going to be more of a slow movement, but I think the movement will come when consumers start to get educated about taking ownership of their own health care. And I think that push hasn't really happened yet, but I think that's a push will happen where patients want to have access to their own uh, control over their own health and over their own health care data. Okay. Do you see any sort of technologies that are currently on the forefront that could help with individuals getting greater access to their to their health records like in terms of mobile technology yeah I th- yeah I think um, um, I, I think mobile is a good example where um, you can have the data on device so when you have a clinical encounter you can have that information there um, I think the other thing is that some of the ways you collect the data um, you can start to do it in a kind of a privacy preserving way uh, where you're collecting data that's physiological based like if it's an image or audio recording and you're trying to glean some information from it because of advances in binarized neural nets, edge computing, you can start to do these on device now. So you have this ability that you're not just shipping raw video and audio data to the to the cloud to analyze, you're actually computing on device. And so I think advances there are helping a lot where you can start to do, you know, you can glean insights from data that you, it's your own data, but you're not, you know, shipping these data sets um, somewhere else. So th- those are things that I think will help. Sounds good. All right, so we'll kind of wrap up here, but I guess what have you thought about the Heidelberg Laureate Forum so far? Uh, 
Yeah. Have you enjoyed it? Yeah, I mean, the Heidelberg Laureate Forum is is quite an amazing um, experience. I've been lucky to have students for the last couple of years attend. And so every time when one of the students comes back, they're always raving about it. And so it's, gr- it's great to be able to experience it in person. I mean, I would encourage any student to apply for the HLF because it is probably the most incredible experience you'll ever have in your career. Even for me, where I'm in the lounge with the laureates where I have you know four or five Turing Award winners around me and I'm having these deep conversations. Just before this podcast, I was in an amazing conversation on neural nets. And, and like, <laughs> when would I ever have this? When, I, when do I have five Turing Award winners, a couple of Nobel laureates around me discussing computing? And, and, and this is the same kind of discussions that the students are having. So this is an amazing opportunity for students. It's, a, it's an intimate environment where it's designed to be a smallish conference. There's about 200 attendees, but it's designed in a way that all the activities force conversation. And all the laureates are excited to talk to young researchers. And it's just, wow, if I was a student, this would be just an amazing experience. I mean, I'm a full professor and I'm still <laughs> aw- awestruck by all these folks that are around me. So, um, but yeah, no, it's been amazing. This is a, such a great forum. And I, I encourage uh, more faculty and students to apply and get, get students here. Yeah, um, it's definitely been pretty interesting. Met some very interesting people, the laureates, the journalists, the students. So anything that you're looking forward to in particular coming up the rest of this week? It's only um, Tuesday. Yeah, so. no, yeah, it's just Tuesday. It's a long, it's a long week. Uh, it's a five-day event, and, and there's not a shortage of exciting things that are happening. But I'm looking forward to some of the hot topic panels. Um, so the hot topic this year is climate change, um, which is a little bit near and dear to me because of my past research in this space. So I'm looking forward to the hot topic panel and then the poster sessions and when the students get a chance to present. Um, so those are always really exciting. Uh, great. Well, thanks for being here, Swedek. Great. Thank, Thank you. Sit down. All right. That's it for today's podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember to like, subscribe, and rate us five stars on iTunes. Look out for an interview with Father of the Internet, Vince Cerf, recorded at Heidelberg, coming soon. Until next time, peace.